All right, probably time to get going. So, Let's do this. Uh, welcome to the six events of Gregory uh, Um Special thanks, uh, especially to the committee members, uh, Professor Vincent Chen and Dr. Ben Dixon. Uh, my name is Dirk England, and I've had the pleasure of serving as Greg's thesis advisor for the last five or so years. A little bit of background, uh, Greg uh, finished his uh, undergraduate degree uh, in physics and in electrical engineering from MIT in 2012, and then uh, worked under the 6A program for one year uh, at Lincoln Laboratory uh, on Indian Wars and Gallium Wars and I and in phosphide, perhaps quantum dots, uh, pushing the way back into the infrared. Um, under the supervision of Jeff Shapiro here on campus and Eric Dolan at Lincoln Laboratory. And then in 2013, joined my research group. Um, so, Greg, uh, fortunate to everybody who worked with him, uh, has been a fantastic student. Uh, he's, you can see some of his work here. And he's also, and this is also pretty nice, been largely free to us. Uh, he has been supported by various fellowships throughout his PhD. First, the National Defense Science and Engineering Graduate Fellowship, NDSA, and uh, then also a Facebook fellowship. So Greg's thesis work uh, has focused on the development of programmable optical circuits, um, the optimization of them, we get very high fidelity and so on, and then the application of such circuits to various problems in classical and quantum communications, and most recently also in uh, optical neural networks, uh, deep learning AI networks, but now in the quantum realm. Uh, that, I believe it's the part that Greg will focus on here, so uh, I don't want to take any more time. Um, uh, but to say, uh, you, know, uh, you know, terrific work so far. So let's see um, the latest of your research. Thanks. Thank you, Dirk. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Vincent. This is exciting. Um, so, as Dirk said, I've spent my PhD working on photonic technologies, that is, technologies that manipulate light. And so the reason we care about light is twofold. Uh, in the classical regime, light is how we connect. It's how we connect different countries together with the internet through undersea cables. It's how we connect computers together in the data center. It's how, if you put a satellite around the moon, you can get data back from it very quickly, as the group at Lincoln Lab did. And in the quantum regime, it's how we connect different parts of our quantum computers. Uh, it's how you wire qubits together over distance. It's how you send quantum information over distance. It helps you make precision measurements over distance, etc. cetera. But I think they want to move your podium next because your body is blocking some of the visual view graph. <clears throat> Widescreen projectors. <laughs> Better? Yeah. Great. Cool. So, as Dirk said, uh, I've been working on what we call programmable photonics, that is, photonic circuits you can reprogram to perform all sorts of operations. Uh, I've worked on applications of these to a number of different areas. Uh, first, I, well, not first, one of the areas is on what's called flow switching, which is what Vincent works on, uh, and looking at different ways of applying these programmable circuits to classical optical networks. I worked on a theory project with a postdoc named uh, Yoav Lahini, uh, basically applying photonic uh, optimization, photonic, programmable photonics to cold atom and bosonic systems. Uh, and then I've been working lately on what we call quantum optical neural networks and one-way quantum repeaters. And since I'm at kind of a lack of time overall, I'm going to be focusing on these three areas, so the programmable photonics, the quantum optical neural networks, and the one-way quantum repeaters. If you're interested in the others, I've included citations down here at the end. So before diving in, I need to put a little background up um, to talk about what quantum photonics is. That is, how do we encode kind of quantum states and quantum information into light? And so the simplistic model we're going to be using here is essentially a single excitation of a resonator. So if you've got a whole bunch of different optical modes, which are just places that you could have a light, um, a single photon is a single excitation of that mode. So there's a, you know, a nice integral at the bottom that's a more realistic picture. Uh, but basically, balls moving on rails is a good enough picture, um, as long as you 
think of them as quantum balls and not just like classical balls moving along those rails. Um, formally, this means that the, the modes are, that we have single mode waveguides and that all of our photons are in kind of the same, have the same spatial and temporal wave functions, um, but are in different physical spatial modes. So the way that we encode quantum information onto this is through what's called a dual rail encoding. It's really complicated. If it's in the top one, it's a zero. If it's in the bottom one, it's a one. Uh, and then we can tile a whole bunch of these together. Uh, so if you've got, you know, say eight waveguides, you've got your first photon might be split across the first two, making one qubit here that's split 50-50. Your second qubit might be split 80-20 across the second. Your third qubit might be like this, and your fourth qubit might be entirely in the zero state. But the point is that each pair of modes has one photon in it. And each of those, that state, whether it's in the zero state or the one state or a superposition of those, encodes the qubit state that we care about. And so to describe this, you need uh, two to the number of qubits that you have, number of complex coefficients to store the state, uh, which means that when you kind of reach any kind of reasonable size of these systems, it's impossible to store that state on a quantum computer. Um, obviously, we can store 16 numbers on a quantum computer, or a classical computer, relatively easily, uh, but to describe the state of a quantum computer with 50 or 100 qubits is basically impossible because um, you have you know, 2 to the 50 or 2 to the 100 coefficients you would need to store. Just want to make sure. Yeah. If they have 50 50s in mixed state, there's not any kind of pure state. Uh, no. State, right? I mean, here, well, here is what I meant is that it's in a 50 50 superposition of 0 and 1. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. so not a mix. No, no, not a mix. Non mixed. Yeah, I mean a coherent superposition. Oh, okay, some arbitrary state, but half-half yeah. superposition. So okay. it's analogous to polarization modes, yeah, right? Okay. Where you can be, if you are in the horizontal and vertical basis, yeah. this would be, for instance, a positive diagonal state. Yeah. So the density operator is one single vector. Correct. Not two vector. Okay, just want to make sure. Yep. Okay. So the next important thing here is that. How do we work with these things? What do we do to these photons once we have them on these rails? Uh, and so the trick is that we put them through optical systems, and we can describe those systems by what are called unitary transformations. Uh, so we can take a relatively famous optical circuit uh, that was a science paper in 2008. Uh, we'll go through what this actually means later. But essentially what this is is it's a beam splitter here with one third reflectivity. And then these are all beam splitters with the marked reflectivities also. Uh, this happens to encode a linear optical quantum gate. But we can describe this uh, by a matrix over the optical modes. So you can see that the first two optical modes only mix with each other, and so the rest of those rows and columns are zero, indicating that light that enters in VA or C0 doesn't mix with any of the other modes. And then these other four are kind of mixing together, as described by the beam splitter relations here. Uh, but the key point here being that any linear optical system we have, that is, any system whose behavior doesn't depend on the intensity of the light, uh, can be described by a unitary transformation. And the behavior of the light through this, when we have identical photons, is not described by that unitary. It's described by a transformation of that unitary that's given by basically a transformation of the field operators, where UJI here is the matrix here. And you have to deal with the kind of commutation relations that come from the particles being indistinguishable. Um, but the simple, ver or the simple message here is that we can describe optical systems by unitary transformations, and we can then describe the effect of these unitary transformations on a quantum state. And so if we do that, and we look at a restricted basis here, which is you know basically only looking at the different cases where you've got one photon in each pair of modes on these four central modes, so this is now that same dual rail encoding. Uh, if you go down here, the second and third modes only have one photon, the third and fourth only have one photon, and the first and sixth have no photons. And so you can describe a logical basis over this, and it turns out that when you do the calculations to figure out what happens, you get this relationship. And so this is what's known as a controlled knot operation. If the first qubit is in a zero state, it does nothing. And if the first qubit's in the one state, it flips the state of the second qubit. And so the important part here, the part that distinguishes linear photonics, that is unitary operators here, from classical quantum computation or normal quantum computation, uh, is this one third at the front. And so what this says is that this is only describing a submatrix of the entire system. So conditioned on the fact that we enter in this basis and leave in this basis, you get this operation. But that only happens with amplitude one-third or probabilistically only one-ninth of the time. 
But if you post select on that, uh, which is how all linear optical quantum gates work, uh, you get this kind of operation. And so you can do that in a way that's such that you detect when that happens, and when it happens successfully, you move on. But this is kind of a distinguishing feature of linear optics, is that we can't make a full quantum computer just out of linear optics alone without having any kind of uh, either nonlinearity or induced nonlinearity through measurement. Uh, so the, but despite that, we know that linear photonics is still hard to describe classically. So if we take kind of a whole network of these beam splitters that mix the light up, uh, we put some photons in, and we basically ask where do they come out. Uh, so we do the same transformation here, where we've got photon creation operators, where we put photons in, we transform them, and we ask what does the probability distribution of counts at the output look like. Uh, to be able to simulate that classically, uh, you have to actually calculate the permanent of a number of matrices, uh, of n by n matrices, where n is the number of photons. And so we know that the permanent is classically very hard to, comp uh, to compute uh, unless you make some very radical assumptions uh, that uh, are morally equivalent to p equals np. So we have very good reasons to believe that this is not possible to simulate classically, uh, barring some wild revision of our understanding of computational complexity theory. Uh, and so we know that basically just linear circuits are hard to describe classically, so that if we can do these experiments, we can do things that we couldn't do and we couldn't simulate ever on a classical computer, uh, so long as we scale them large enough. And there's been a number of experiments um, basically trying to actually build these systems, uh, trying to grow them to ever larger sizes. So here you've got um, basically the size of the photon, uh, the number of photons you get input. Here's the total loss through the system, or the total transmission coefficient through the system. And basically the, this is how hard it is to actually simulate these things on a classical computer versus being able to just put, build these systems and do them. And so if we can kind of get into this regime here, we're in a regime that you couldn't ever simulate classically. Uh, and so we know that just linear photonics now is like hard to simulate classically, which gives us at least some motivation to actually try to build these things, as these people did. Um, and the way that they do them and the way that people have been building uh, linear photonics for a while at scale, so that you can have kind of six, eight, ten modes with multiple photons in them, is through what are called photonic circuits. And so this is the picture I showed before. This is a 2008 science paper out of Jeremy O'Brien's group at Bristol, uh, where they use basically uh, its silica waveguides, so glass waveguides, uh, that they etch on top of a silicon waver, uh, wafer. And they use these waveguides, essentially just as small optical fibers on top of a chip, to guide light. And so they can, by carefully manufacturing these things so that you've got just the right spacing between the waveguides, and that space is just the right length, they can get kind of close to this transformation. Uh, there have been other efforts, uh, for instance, uh, generating a whole bunch of multimode inf interferometers, uh, try to do this boson sampling, also using silicon silicon. Um, the problem with this approach is that you need to make a different device for every experiment. If you want to make that CNOT gate we talked about, you've got to make one device. If you want to make a boson sampling device, uh, which is the putting photons through arbitrary unitaries that's classically hard, uh, it's, you have to make a separate device, you have to make a whole bunch of separate devices. Uh, and so our goal here was to get past that not have to make a different device for every experiment, and furthermore, the idea being that if it's programmable, that maybe you could also compensate for the errors that show up in fabrication, because the spacing between those waveguides and the length of them isn't exactly what you would want in real life. So the fidelity of the operations you perform isn't ideal. But our feeling was that if you could actually kind of make a reconfigurable chip, you could program it and get maybe compensate for that fabrication error. And so that's what I'm talking about. And so... The architecture is based on a unit cell called the Mach Center Interferometer. Uh, it's essentially more of these waveguides. These are beam splitters that are supposed to be about 50-50. So this light comes in this top rail, half goes up, half goes down, and then it recombines with itself. And then we've got phase shifters at the input and output. And so what we know is that we can basically program an arbitrary 2x2 two two unitary into this. And we know that if we tile these, as Reconcilinger showed in 94, uh, any unitary transformation of arbitrary dimension can be programmed. So this is our, you know, arbitrary 2x2, two two, but if we wanted to make, say, an 8x8, eight eight, we might make something that looks like this. And so to take that C0 gate again as an example, we can look at this, we've got a few beam splitters, we say, okay, we've got a mesh of all these Mach Zender interferometers, and 
we can now figure out how to set those phases to actually realize that same gate. But how do we make a chip that does that? So we know what schematically it should look like, but how do we actually get a chip like that? So the answer is silicon photonics, uh, which is a fairly robust commercial platform uh, originally developed for the communications industry. The idea is that you've got glass chips, that is uh, bulk oxide of glass growing on top of a silicon substrate. You've got a thin layer of silicon on top of it, uh, which we can then leverage kind of the billions of billions of dollars that have been put into silicon manufacturing to actually fabricate these things with high fidelity and uh, high accuracy. And you can make circuits out of them. Uh, grading couplers allow you to couple light on. Um, you can make modulators by heating up the waveguides. You can make photo detectors. Um, but the idea here is that, yeah, we can use this commercial silicon process to manufacture one of these programmable photonic circuits. So we did, uh, which is what we're seeing here. You've got an overlay of the schematic here. And if you zoom in on a unit cell, what we have here are heaters. So when you heat up silicon or when you change the temperature of most materials, their index of refraction changes, which means that the amount of phase that light picks up as it travels through it changes. Uh, so we can heat up the silicon waveguides, which doesn't induce any extra loss, but it does change the phase. And so we get our little programmable unit cell, and we tile it together. And lo and behold, we have a programmable photonic circuit. Not quite that simple. Um, Fortunately, we need to do a whole bunch of work on packaging control. And this is what I, I and others uh, spent a huge amount of time on uh, throughout our PhDs. Um, so for one, we need to do electrical packaging. We've got you know, tons of these individual little heaters here that we need to each control with high precision. So we need to kind of get wires attached to each of those pads. So hundreds and hundreds of electrical connections that we have to get out somewhere else so that we can apply the right voltages to them. We have to thermally stabilize this thing. So we're you know, controlling the temperature of each of those little modulators, which affects the temperature of the overall system. So you get crosstalk, but you also, more importantly, get uh, thermal expansion of the system, which can affect the coupling of light onto it. And in general, if you don't have a thermally stable system, you can't use temperature to control how the system behaves. And then, not just electrical packaging, we need electrical feedback and control. So these are some circuits I designed and had manufactured. Uh, these are basically little modules that you can plug into a larger motherboard, each of which has 40 electronic channels. Uh, this does the kind of driving of those heaters, and it stacks on top of this board that basically monitors how much current and voltage we're applying to each of those heaters so that we can feed back and program these things with high fidelity. So it's not just an open loop system, but we're monitoring what we're doing to it, uh, and, which is super important when we're trying to program these things with really high fidelity. And so in terms of the performance of the system, um, we get, the modulators themselves uh, have a bandwidth of about 100 kilohertz, maybe 150 kilohertz. Uh, we can set all the phases, all 240 phases on a device in about a millisecond. Uh, in terms of propagation losses on chip, uh, we get about 2 dB, which is good. It's actually really good for what we have currently. It's not what we'll need for the future for quantum applications, but it's good. Um, coupling a lot of optical modes on and off of these chips is still really hard, but we can do it to some degree with some loss. Uh, that's good enough for the kind of technological demos we want to do. And the individual mod vendors have what's called really good visibility. This says that those 50-50 beam splitters we manufactured are really very close to being 50-50 uh, with very little variability. And so to prove that we actually did build this thing, uh, here's kind of a, a chip characterizing itself. So you can, this is infrared light traveling through this thing. You've got, you can see each of the individual mod vendors here. And what we're doing is basically we route light along a wire at the edge, and then we sweep those heaters to characterize what the voltage to phase transformation is here. Uh, so this happens pretty rapidly for the whole chip, it's slowed down a little bit here for the sake of the video, uh, but these things work. So, the no, God, no. Uh, this one was fabricated at Opsis. Uh, so this was at IME in Singapore, uh, when Opsis still existed. Um, no, God, no. <laughs> uh, Speaking of fabrication, I said that this is a viable commercial process. We have really great accuracy. We've leveraged all of the uh, work that's been put into silicon manufacturing over the years, but there's still fabrication errors. And so this was true for the original kind of custom circuits people were building. Uh, if you calculate the what's called the fidelity of this quantum gate, uh, people were getting about 94% fidelity out of 
custom circuits. And so what we did was we went and we took uh, full-scale wafer data for what we expected the beam splitting ratio variation to be, what we expected the loss variation to be throughout our chips, and we built models, uh, Monte Carlo simulations, of how we could expect those chips to behave. And so when we simulated it, we found that we actually had a pretty similar behavior. Uh, so the median fidelity here um, of the performance of our systems was about 94% also. Uh, but unlike these custom circuits, we now have knobs we can turn. And so one of the first things we did, or I did, was to basically demonstrate that as long as we characterize what those errors are, we can go in and we can twiddle all those knobs and find a slightly different way to program the circuit so that we actually recover high fidelity operation of the system. So this is thermal twinning, right? Yeah. Okay. So, but we're, it, we're applying slightly different phases than, so the blue is if you apply the phases that you like should apply if the system is perfect. Green is after our optimization. And so this is a log plot. We've got a median of 94% fidelity here. Our median here is 99.99%. You can see that in some cases, due to just like variations, uh, these are kind of the ones that didn't do as well, or the ones that we, when we simulated them, we kind of made worse assumptions or made assumptions that the system didn't perform as well. Um, so this is for the CNOT gate. We found similar improvements for what's called the controlled phase gate uh, for a full quantum algorithm called the iterative phase estimation algorithm. Um, but in summary, we kinda, we've developed this platform. We call it a programmable nanophotonics platform, or PNP. Uh, we can optimize them to overcome fabrication errors. And kind of high level, we have a box we can program to perform arbitrary unitary transformations. So sweeping a whole bunch of work under the rug, we now have that. And next question was, what, what can we do with it? And so, looking toward the future, uh, we wanted to see, we did a whole bunch of work trying to develop what we call quantum optical neural networks. And so, again, taking a step back, uh, what is an artificial neural network? Artificial neural networks are things that have been developed for a whole bunch of different applications. Uh, they have applications in recognizing images and video, uh, playing games like chess, Go, Dota, doing speech recognition, language processing. It's used on your Alexa or Google Home if you have something at home that listens to you. Uh, it's used for control of aut autonomous vehicles. It's used in a whole bunch of different fields. Uh, so basically, the key point here being that this is a technique that's found like wide applicability throughout uh, very many different fields. And we kind of wanted to look at it in our field of like, what can we do with this model? And so the way artificial neural networks work is you put some input data in. Uh, which are these kind of what are called input layer neurons. You've got this dense connection here, uh, and you've got a nonlinear layer here. And so what this is doing is this is applying some kind of matrix operation here that takes all that input data and transforms it, and then kind of sums up all the, some, you know, each of these values times some weight at each of these next neurons. And then uh, those neurons each apply a nonlinear transformation uh, in this case, this is a sigmoid, that's one example, but the point being that it, uh, if you just tie all linear operations together, one after the other, you may as well only have one of them. But if you put a nonlinear operation in the middle, you get different behavior out of it. Uh, and so what this looks like is, this is the sigmoid operation, and so what you're doing is you take kind of values in this wide range of really any value coming in, and you map it into the range 0 to 1. Uh, so you're compressing basically all the real numbers into this small range, which is a highly nonlinear operation. But the point is that you've got some nonlinear operation there uh, that you're performing, and uh, that basically means that when you tile a linear operation with a nonlinear operation, you get more robust or more novel behavior out of it. Um, so how do we train these things? How do we actually use these to recognize images, et cetera? Um, so the basic idea is that, let's say, you want to recognize cats. Uh, you, t you put in a picture of a cat at the front, you tell it that it should have a cat, that it's looking at a cat, and you twiddle kind of all those weights and some parameters of the nonlinear optimization, and you do this a whole bunch of times. You showed a picture of a cat, you showed a picture of a dog, you showed another picture of a dog, you showed a picture of a cat, you showed a picture of a cow, and you do this a whole bunch of times. Um, the more data you have, the more it learns. Uh, and after you do that for a while, when you show it images it hasn't seen before, I, assuming you've structured ne your neural network correctly and done a whole bunch of work, um, that you know, Google and Amazon and Facebook pay people ridiculous amounts of money to figure out. Regardless, at some point you've got a thing that recognizes new pictures of animals and classifies them for you. So the question we had was, what if instead of a cat, you wanted to recognize Schrodinger's cat? That is, you don't want to put pictures in, you want to put quantum states in. 
So obviously a classical computer can't do that. To fully characterize a quantum state, again, you need an, an exponential amount of information. So unless you want to do full process tomography on a quantum state and then encode this exponentially larger operation in, you can't use a classical neural network. So what if you, how do we kind of process quantum states using a neural network? So we are not the first people to ask this question. Uh, there have been a whole bunch of proposals uh, for basically realizing machine learning and neural networks on quantum computers. The thing that basically all of these proposals have in common is that they rely on what's called the gate-based model of quantum computing. So they basically assume that you've got a quantum computer or a approximate quantum computer that you can just program and like program these gates into and lo and behold you get a neural network out of it in some sense. Um, but we have something slightly different. So if we go back to the architecture for a second, we've got this dense matrix multiplication. So that looks a heck of a lot like what the PNP can do. Um, slight difference here is that you know, this performs unitary operations, so number of input modes to number of output modes is the same number, but basically it's a dense matrix multiplication. Uh, and so we and some others um, realized you could make photonic neural networks out of this. So but the, you put attenuation before it goes to the next stage, it doesn't, it, you can generate even more uh, um, operation than you can sort of It's like you read this paper. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, so the, they, in this paper what they do is they do a singular value decomposition. Yeah, um, and so then, you can do it. yeah. yeah you um, but in the quantum regime, obviously you don't want to induce loss. Yeah. So, yeah. anyway, so the so point being here, yeah, you tile these unitary operations together um, with some nonlinearities, but note that, uh, and so this you know, this paper spawned actually two competing startups uh, out of our group and out of Marin Selyacic's group. Uh, and they're both particularly well funded and they're trying to actually manufacture these things to make like photonic neural networks. Um, so they've at least convinced some people that these things are really kind of viable and useful. Uh, but you'll notice that even at the time they wrote this paper, they were kind of sweeping this nonlinearity under the rug. Because even in classical systems, uh, getting a strong photonic nonlinearity, that is a system that responds differently to different intensities of light, is hard, uh, more so in the quantum regime. So, you know, we have this thing, we know how to build these, but this is the question. So we want a nonlinearity. So what we want, we don't want our amplitude to be affected by the phase shift, because that generates loss, and we want to kind of preserve our photons as they go through the system. Um, but what we, so what we want is we want a phase shift that's affected by the photon number at that site. So, uh, we know that if you have a strong enough one of these, it's universal for quantum computing together with arbitrary unitaries. The question is, how do we get them? And so this has been a kind of robust area of research by other groups. Uh, people have looked at putting uh, quantum dots in waveguides, so interacting basically the photon with a two-level system, uh, solid-state quantum memory, uh, using graphene plasmons. This goes back to a long time ago, looking at uh, single photons in nonlinear cavities with Imamoglu. Um, but it turns out, actually, uh, I had done some work earlier, I touched on this briefly at the beginning, uh, of how do we, can we engineer systems that have uh, cold atoms trapped in optical lattices, so what are called ultra-cold bosons. Uh, so they're bosons, they're much like photons, but they have mass. And we looked at, can you engineer simple kind of time invariant systems uh, to generate arbitrary quantum logic? Uh, so this is a paper I wrote with Yoav, um, who has a co-first author on, and we showed that you can actually kind of make a, universal gate set out of these things. And so, talk about what that means for a second. Uh, what we have is atoms trapped in a photonic lattice. So this is our atom, this is, uh, we're interfering some light together that uh, creates optical potential that basically makes it so that the atoms want to sit at the bottom of these wells. And so, we can use the same dual rail encoding that we use for photonics. Uh, if the photon's on the left, it's a zero. If the photon's on the right, it's a one. Turns out they have really ridiculously good control over these optical lattices also. So they can change basically both the on-site potential and how likely it is for this atom to kind of hop over to the other side. And so by engineering these, uh, you can cause the phase evolution of this state, of the zero state, to go along at a different rate than the one state, and you can generate arbitrary single photon uh, rotations out of that. Uh, you can make a two qubit gate by putting two of these next to each other, much like we do with photonic systems. The difference is we have nonlinearities here, uh, which basically means that there's an energy cost associated with 
both of these atoms being in the same place. They interact with each other and they try to repel each other, so they try to stay in different uh, modes or different wells. And so what we showed is that with this model, which is essentially the same type of nonlinearity that we'd like in optical systems, uh, you can in fact make a universal quantum system. So what we're showing here is the operation of a controlled not gate again. But now it's not a post it's not post selected anymore. It's a it's a kind of probability equals one C not gate. And so again, that first mode is kind of separated from the rest of it. And so what you can see here, and this is I think really cool, um, when this photo when this boson, when this atom isn't interacting with the other three, it's separated completely. This guy starts out in the zero state and it kind of hops back and forth at some rate. And sometimes it comes over here. So it's not in the like we have at some point we'll have some probability of there being an atom here and an atom here and no atom here and no atom here. Um, and that's not that doesn't correspond to a qubit state. That's what we call a non-computational state. But by the time you get to the end, you're back in a computational state. And so what we've done is we've engineered a system that, so long as you put something in a computational state, the interferences line up just right so that you get out of computational state also. And so that you can see the way that this actually works is due to that interaction, that uh, change in energy associated with these things sharing the same site, when you move that control atom over here, it causes this thing to oscillate back and forth slower. And so it goes through one half fewer oscillations. And so whereas before it would have made it all the way back to its starting point, now it only makes it half the way over. And since this is a coherent process, this effectively fully realizes a controlled not gate. Um, and so this is really cool. We've seen basically that like the same type of linearity that we think we might someday be able to achieve in photonic systems, uh, even if we don't vary these things over time, you can make kind of a full set of quantum logic out of them. But that only gets you one gate. And so if you want to kind of do computations with these things, you're going to want to change what kind of potential you're applying to do different gates as you go along. Um, so we said, okay, can we make quantum optical neural networks? Can we do something similar to that, but where we can actually change that uh, connectivity, that uh, we can reconfigure the nonlinear potentials over time? And so what we came up with was essentially, yes, we can. What we do is we take our unitaries, we tile them, and then we have this on-site interaction term. And so this is slightly different than before, uh, with the uh, cold atoms, because now you don't have photons hopping between while there's nonlinear action going on. It's there's the hopping, but you've got the all-to-all -all hopping now, not just nearest neighbor, and then you've got the nonlinearity. But what this lets you do is it lets you kind of vary this over time as you go through a system. So, so let me try to understand. Yeah. You try doing the nonlinearity instead of using nonlinear optics like that. Type two, type three. <laughs> you're trying to eat that with some boson. So that was what the cold atoms were doing. Uh, the, the the both yeah. they were interacting with each other. Yeah. yeah. Here, no. So here, no. So the this uh, the light just provides a trapping potential. Mm -hmm. The atoms themselves actually take the place of the photons here. Okay. So they are the kind of quantum walkers. Uh, you the optical lattice is just uh, coherent laser light that you use to form a potential okay. that you then kind of dial in the parameters of. So you've got the kind of coupling parameters between adjacent sites, you've got the on-site energies, mm -hmm. and so those affect the on-site or phase evolvement rate, eh, rate of evolve. Um, but yeah, no, it's the bosons here. So this is an analogy. Uh, an analogy? Yeah. So, well, not an analogy. No, like, you could also go off and build this thing. Uh, and Mark, uh, there's a group at Harvard that does kind of these cold atoms and has control over these systems, and we actually used their experimental parameters to say, hey, look, we can actually make these things with reasonable fidelity. Okay. That was the point of this paper. Um, we are going to be using current linearities here. Uh, using yeah. So, but the power level has to be very high. Uh, or you have to trap it in a very good cavity. Okay. So we're leaving that toward future work. Uh, it's not mine. It's um, there's a guy sitting in the back left back there whose job it is to figure that out. Thanks, Michael. Um, <laughs> so we got these. But the point is, yeah, we've got. But, but just to jump. Yeah. Really? Atoms or atom. Yeah. He's actually bad. Yeah, so. Like, 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 like,
Yeah, no, we're completely abstracting this away. We make what's called a monochromatic assumption. So we, we abstract away a lot of the details of this nonlinearity. Um, it turns out that may or may not be actually all that important. Uh, due to some programming bugs, we experimented with all sorts of different nonlinear uh, functions. Um, and where I was applying different nonlinearities to this, and it, we still got good behavior out of it. Uh, features, yeah. Uh, <laughs> bugs are features, yeah. No, so, which was good, actually, because it showed that like it, we weren't super sensitive to the exact form of this nonlinearity. Of course, you can also do nonlinearity by doing measurements, so you mm -hmm. can detect in between and project part of the substance, right? Yep. Uh, I looked at that, actually. Uh, I didn't get I didn't get a... So I looked at like a nonlinearity where you make a measurement mm -hmm. of the photon number, and then you re-emit that photon number back into yeah, the waveguide. Right, right. It didn't seem to perform as well. Uh, I didn't, uh, the, at that point in the code, the code was not super performant. Um, someone else could go back now and probably do a much better job of that and kind of work out what the actual performance relationship is. But yeah, the code for that is basically there to do that again. Um, we'll talk about density matrices in a bit. So for right now, we're thinking about kind of coherent systems with no loss and with this idealized nonlinearity. Uh, but it's a, on-site current on linearity, so it's a self-curve phase modulation, where basically the phase that gets applied is proportional to the photon number in that mode. Uh, so we're, again, we've separated kind of the coupling stage from the nonlinear stage. Uh, and so we wanted to benchmark this thing, you know, figure out, like, the, can we actually do things with this? Well, what do we want to do with it? Um, how do we, like, again, classify Schrodinger's cat? And so the kind of quantum version of Schrodinger's cat, or one of them, is the Bell states. So there's this four, these four states of uh, maximally entangled states over a pair of qubits. So we can encode these on uh, four optical modes, again, using that same dual rail encoding, and then basically say, OK, can we tune the parameters of the system in the same way that we kind of train classical neural networks? Can we twiddle the phases that we're applying to those um, unitaries and the strength of these nonlinearities in such a way that we realize kind of uh, something that allows us to classify these things. And so, oh, so this is the dual rail encoding. So you've got four optical modes, uh, and you have a superposition over uh, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, or 0, 1, 1, 0, et cetera. Um, but so basically, could we fi find a way that basically, like, we get, we put these in, and we get out a deterministic measurement? So we put in a bell state, and we know exactly what it was. This is now, with probability 1, if you put it in the first bell state, you get out the binary number 0. Uh, if you put in the second bell state, you get out the binary number 1, etc. cetera. Uh, and so turns out the answer is yes. Um, we have a paper on this that you can go look up. But the, the blue lines here are basically the CNOT gates. And so what we did is we varied the size of these systems. We changed the depth of them, uh, where two layers here is a single nonlinear layer. Uh, this is two nonlinear layers with three unitary transformations, et cetera. Uh, and so what you can see is, OK, um, in this case with the CNOT, one layer is sufficient, but it's not that easy to train. Uh, about half the time, you don't kind of find a local solution. And so what we're doing is we're using a gradient-free method to do this optimization. So we're doing a local gradient-free optimization. Uh, so basically, you pick some random phases, uh, and you twiddle those to make the cost function go down locally. And so and that's essentially what classical neural networks do also, uh, except that they have an efficient gradient there. But it's the same idea. is It's a local optimization. So so you only tweak a subset of the things. No, no, no. Uh, you tweak all of them. You tweak all of them. So look at all the gradients. Yeah. So, oh, no, you, we don't bother actually computing the, so the black box optimization software takes care of approximating the gradient for us. Yeah. Uh, we use what's called bounded optimization by quadratic approximation. So what it does is it doesn't actually do a forward difference of all the free parameters at every time step in the way that a gradient would. Yeah. Uh, instead, it does a subset of them to, the yeah. That's yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, we don't have to do any of that. Oh. We just feed it to a, oh, you feed it to a machine. Yeah. That's just one of my students are working on. Yeah. Machine. So uh, I use actually Stephen Johnson's software, Professor yeah. Stephen Johnson. Uh, he has a great nonlinear optimization package that lets you kind of select from a range of different optimization algorithms. But so the key point here being, OK, yeah, we can do this with two layers, but what we see as we increase the layer count is actually really cool. It's that we kind of get this convergence where the more layers we have, the more likely it is we find a local solution that's as good as the global solution. And there's kind of this like phase change where the qualitative behavior changes as you reach a certain layer count. So what this says is, OK, cool. We can train these things by twiddling them locally. Um, 
and we showed that uh, kind of for the Bell state, we showed we can make a CNOT gate, we showed we could uh, do GHC state generation, which are just three kind of classical quantum optics tasks. But we said, okay, what else can we do with this thing? That's kind of training to do a set task. It's not, it doesn't do any generalization. Uh, so we collaborated with um, Johnny Olson, who was a postdoc at Harvard and now at Zapata Computing, uh, and came up with this idea to do basically a quantum optical autoencoder. And the basic idea here is that you take a higher dimensional uh, space of quantum information and you're compressing it onto a lower dimensional space. And this is really important for photonics uh, because if you're moving quantum information over distance, the probability of that happening goes exponentially in the number of photons. It gets worse and worse the more photons you have. So if you've got four qubits of information, but you can compress that information onto a single photon, you get a power of four in your transmission rate success. So what this does is it's uh, encoding uh, a state that represents uh, something about the energy levels of the hydrogen atom as you vary the bond length. Uh, but basically it's a contrived uh, example where you've got kind of these nonlinear functions uh, and you train it on a certain subset of them and then show that it can compress any of this kind of family of states. Uh, and so our fidelity numbers are here. Basically, we tried different, a couple of different optimization algorithms. One is where basically we just try twiddling all the phases on all the things individually. And this one is where we kind of remove one qubit at a time. We found this one worked better, but the point is that we can do this. We can compress this higher dimensional quantum information onto a lower dimensional space. Uh, which then would allow us to, to, say, transmit quantum information over distance. We address a number of other tasks. Uh, worked with postdoc Jacques, who's in the back, on basically showing we could train these things to simulate qu other quantum systems by feeding them uh, representations of the desired input and output states corresponding to that system. Uh, showed that it could, we could train them to perform a classical reinforcement learning task of bouncing an inverted pendulum. I don't have time to go through all of that, but the idea is that we, we showed that we could do a whole bunch of different things that these things could learn to generalize what they had seen to new regimes. And so finally, uh, most recently what we've been doing is been looking at uh, applying these to one-way quantum repeaters. And so what those are are, well, quantum repeaters are part of how we move quantum information over distance. And so Again, taking a step back, the big picture, the idea is in the future is that we'll have something like the quantum internet, uh, where you've got a whole bunch of different nodes that are networked together. Um, you might want to be performing secure communication between two of them, uh, secured by quantum key distribution. Uh, you might want to be doing networked quantum computing, where you're moving quantum information between one site and another. Uh, you might be trying to do more precise sensing, timing distribution, etc. There's all sorts of reasons you might want to uh, transmit quantum states over distance without measuring them. Uh, and so there's also future applications, who knows. But all of these kind of rely on being able to efficiently move that quantum information from one point to another that might be very far away. So a one-way quantum repeater is this idea that instead of encoding your information onto a single photon, you encode that one qubit worth of information, say, onto multiple photons. The idea being that maybe if you only lose one of those photons, you can still kind of recover that information at the other, at an intermediate stage, re-encode it back so that you know, start with five photons, you lose one of them, you put that other photon back in, recover the full state at the intermediate stage, and as long as you do this often enough, you've lost at most one photon, you're in the single photon loss regime, and you can kind of keep uh, recovering the state fully at each stage. It's analogous to classical forward error correction. Um, but for loss, instead of for, say, uh, phase errors or bit errors. So there have been a number of different proposals of how to do this. Uh, this is out of Dong Jiang's group at Yale, uh, where they've been looking at a whole bunch of different ways of structuring these codes really carefully. Uh, some work out of our own group from here, Pont, who graduated a couple years ago and now works for a startup doing quantum computing. Um, one proposal we were particularly interested in comes out of Norbert Lukenhaus's group. And the idea is that instead of kind of designing codes really carefully, what we care about is being able to design these repeaters. And so can we kind of engineer these repeaters to just like basically specify the behavior we want out of them? And then, which is basically, you know, that you put in a state that's lost a photon, you get, you get out the corrected state afterwards. And they showed that like you can write down Hamiltonians that perform this behavior, uh, but they note at the end that they really don't know how to realize these in actual systems. They can describe theoretically what it should do, but they don't know how to realize it. And so our question was, hey, can we apply quants to this? Can we do this with quantum optical neural networks? The idea being that, hey, okay, you start with this encoded state, which is, you know, some set of photons more than one. You feed it, put it through some loss where it loses, you know, zero or one photons. You feed it into a quant along with some ancilla light because, you know, if you've lost a photon, you'd have a photon there that you might want to put back into the state. 
Um, and then at the output, what you want to get is that same encoded state that you had before the loss back. Uh, and then you'll get you know, some ancilla state out also. Uh, but you can throw that away. The idea being that then you put these often enough and you have kind of a, a quantum repeater that you don't have to do any back and forth in the way that uh, typical quantum repeater protocols might have to do that rely on, say, entangling memories over distance and then using that to move the information along in lockstep. So to make this kind of more concrete, uh, you might have your zero state encoded on, or have your information encoded on four photons in two modes where your zero state is a superposition of all four photons in the first mode and all four photons in the second, and your one state is just two photons in each mode. And so we said, okay, well, if we put this into a loss channel, take a photon out of it, or don't, probabilistically, uh, we're going to need at least two photons here uh, because there's two different measurements the environment can perform. We can lose a photon from the first mode or the second mode. So to, avoid, to basically preserve unitarity, we knew we needed at least two photons in two modes here. Um, and we said, okay, well, can we... So we know what this transfer function should be. We put this together. We put this in. We apply some loss to it. We want to get the same thing out that we put in. Uh, and importantly, what we're going to do is we're, we put through superpositions of these also, not just 0 and 1, to ensure that you're not just measuring the thing and re-emitting it. You can actually preserve kind of the quantum state. And it turns out, yeah, we can do this. Um, it requires fairly large systems, uh, but this is kind of the optimization path it took. Uh, this is now a gradient-based optimization uh, because training these things with the gradient-free methods was hellacious. Um, but yeah, we can do this. We can actually, just by specifying the desired input-output relation, get a quantum repeater, this one-way quantum repeater that, you know, you encode your light, you pass it along, you measure it often enough, and hey, now you get you can transmit quantum information over a longer distance than you would have been able to without any of these in the middle. So I have a puzzling question in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. You go back to the previous video. Okay. So I'll give you a hypothetical situation mm -hmm. where I encode my information in two states, mm -hmm. binary, yeah. and they're not a part of it. It's mm -hmm. not a number state, so yeah. let's say it's a coherent state. There's an angle between them. And when I do a measurement using photon counting, whatever, you get a part quantum optimum measurement, mm -hmm. have some error, mm -hmm. since they're not a problem. With this gadget, I can multiply the information in that single photon, which has uh, the uh, information in printed uh, many, many times. So now, if I do many of these um, uh, measurements, I can get arbitrary low error probability. So, I think you're wrong. Uh, I'm going chalk. I mean, defense should have chalk in it, right? <laughs> um, so, take this code here. So, you've got your zero state for zero, zero four. Yeah. And one, one. So, yeah, we can make an encoder that you put in a qubit with an arbitrary quantum state on it and it produces that state. Yeah. But let's say you measure this thing. So. Greg, you need to do uh, Yes, I do. Thank you. So. What we get out is. So the information here is recoverable, but you get the same measurement out. Mm -hmm. So you can recover the information here, but you haven't gotten any information about the quantum state. If you measure it again, you destroy all the information about the quantum state. I know. So there's, this doesn't violate no cloning is what I'm getting at. Okay. So you're not replicating the quantum state in any way, because there's no measurements you can perform, because these things have the same mean photon number in each mode. You, uh, and making more than one measurement is going to destroy the information. It's going to project the state. That you can't actually kind of amplify your quantum measurement. That's, you can't do this kind of uh, no cloning that would violate unitarity. So I wouldn't get better error probability? Uh, no, unless you know what the angle between those states is, in which case you could make something that performs that kind of nonlinear transformation to get them that specific angle into I, I, it. I actually know the angle. So in, know the angle in, that per, in that case, you should be able to... I have to sit down and do the math. That you can do this. Yeah, so you should be able to do this if you know the angle exactly. How long are you going to stay here? Uh, 
<laughs> I've, got a, I've got a flight on Friday. I know the end goal. I want okay. to know whether you can do better. We'll that. talk. Okay. Yeah. Even if you didn't know the end goal, would that pre-order? No. But you could, in principle, you yeah, know, it would. You should be able to make it. You should be able to make a better measurement of a transformed basis, though, a non-orthogonal basis. So if you know that it's in one of the two, not in a superposition of them. Yeah. No, it's not a qubit. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So anyway, thankfully we're at the end, essentially. So uh, summary um, of this whole thing: we introduced a programmable nanophotonic platform. Uh, we showed we could use these as a building block of a new type of neural network. Uh, showed that they've got a variety of applications. Uh, we can do quantum, traditional quantum information tasks with them. We can apply them to more specialized photonics tasks. Um, in particular, in specialized photonics tasks, we showed that we could make these kind of one-way quantum repeaters. Um, and kind of in a general point, these things allow the discovery of systems that like you would never actually kind of sit down and design by hand. If you look at like, go back to like that CNOT gate, it was all, like four beam splitters. These things have you know n squared free parameters in them. They're these dense, messy unitary transformations. But by letting the computer figure out what those numbers should be, you can get things that you kind of wouldn't just be able to sit down and figure out with a pen and paper. And so, Outlook, um, together with collaborators that I've worked with on this thesis. We've kind of put together pieces of a toolbox. You've got your unitary transformations. You've got an architecture you might be able to train to perform more interesting things. Um, you might want to. You might have to modify this depending on what nonlinear transformations you choose, what you have access to experimentally. Uh, but it's a toolbox that you can kind of that can go along with the experimental progress in the field uh, to kind of figure out what's possible with these systems. Uh, to that end, I've open sourced. It's currently not. Done, but it's open source and available. You can go look at it. Uh, this library I wrote for doing these quantum optical neural network simulations, it's accelerated. Uh, there are gradients available so that you can actually do back propagation through these things. Um, and you can kind of sit down, you can you know, replicate my work, you can go try to apply these things to new applications. Uh, if you have any questions about it, shoot me an email, shoot me a message on GitHub, whatever. Um, on the experimental side, in terms of actually realizing these things, we've got some really pretty hard but solvable problems. Uh, we need strong nonlinearities. Um, as I said, Michael, um, and other people in the field are obviously also interested. Uh, we're going to need low loss, large, fast systems, uh, especially if you kind of don't want to have to tile a whole bunch of these things, but you want to be reconfiguring a couple of them at a time. Uh, that kind of 150 kilohertz thermal tuning isn't going to do it, but there are other material platforms like lithium niobate that are going to be low loss, high speed, uh, that you can manufacture these systems in. And we're going to need integrated devices at scale. You're going to need single photon sources, single photon detectors, kind of integrated with these systems as well. Uh, hard, but experimentally doable. So that kind of wraps things up. I have a ridiculously long list of people to thank. Um, first of all, Dirk. Uh, let's see, I think it was January 2013 when I first met you. I walked into your office. Um, you asked me what I wanted to work on. I said I was sick of single devices. I was sick of everyone kind of optimizing one thing. I wanted to build systems. I think we did that. I think that's. Uh, I think we accomplished that. Um, Vincent, thanks again for like getting me that first job at Lincoln and for all the advice over the years. Because um, without getting me to 67, none of this would have happened. Who knows where I would have ended up? Probably as a math major doing something useless. Um, <laughs> no, I kid. Um, I love mathematicians. Ben, thank you for all your support over the past few years. Um, QPG, all of you guys. I don't, there's way too many of you to list. Um, calling out a few of you. Jacques, thank you for all of your help, uh, especially with the last couple projects, but also for always being like free to talk when I walk into your office randomly as I'm like in a state of like, oh, I just got this thing working. How do, they, like, how do I use this? Um, Catherine, for being a great friend and always there to talk. Uh, Ed, Jake, and Hannah, who aren't here anymore, but Ed was a fantastic office mate. Jake was one of the first people I worked with in all this. Hannah's been a great friend also. Um, Michael, Eric, Mahika, again, for being free to talk whenever I wander into your offices randomly. Um, Mikkel, again, also the same thing. So Lincoln Lab, um, and obviously Scott Hamilton, who couldn't be here today, but he's the group leader at Lincoln. He's been endlessly supportive of me. Matt. Thank you for everything, including all those late night rides home. Um, and just, yeah, being there. Ryan, 
you're phenomenal. Love working with you. Uh, other people who aren't couldn't make it: Jade Wang, Dave Geisler, Dave Kaplan, Cheryl Sarsagaskar. Mom, Dad, thanks for both putting up with everything and supporting me. Sorry, I'm running away to the next coast, but yeah, thank you. Um, Marissa, thank you for being supportive. Appreciate it. Um, who else? Various friends, Walter, Catherine, Aaron, Niv, Mzang, thanks for coming. Um, Anna, who's in Zurich, Carissa, everyone I run with who kept me sane. And I'm sure I've forgotten so many people. But thank you to everyone. I have a quick one. Yeah. Thank you. Have respect for what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So he has similar systems. Um, he has a different way of programming them. He showed a different way of dealing with uh, infidelity in systems where basically instead of a single mock sender, you tile three of them together where, so each mock sender individually can, on the outside, can realize 50-50 beam splitters, um, which lets you get higher fidelity. Uh, he kind of ignores loss as a problem. Um, he does some good theoretical work. He shows like other applications, etc. cetera. Um, but he's a theorist. Um, and he's been really interested in kind of what can we do with linear transformations. He's also really looked at like, what are other, what does it mean otherwise to do linear optics? Like, Frequency translation is a linear operation. How could we use that? Um, what can we apply arbitrary linear transformations to? Can we use it for communications, for beam shaping, etc.? Um, that's mostly what he's been working on. <laughs> Who has got your questions? Matt. Matt. Um, it's morally similar in that you're encoding quantum information onto a higher dimensional state where if you lose photons it's fine. Um, we use kind of some pedagogical examples of bosonic codes where like it's encoded onto a very small number of photons. Um, I have to think that's probably more achievable than these kind of giant cluster states but really it's kind of yeah it's taking the opposite view of like what can we actually design and build kind of with a small number of things rather than like how do we get to push this to the absolute maximum of performance. Yeah, exactly. For your um, thermal based phase shift, mm -hmm. how much do you have to change the temperature? Yeah, so the index of refraction change is about 10 to the minus 2 per Kelvin, I think. Um, so it depends on how long you're willing to make the thing. It's a function of the interaction length. The effective index is about 2.5. So I think it about uh, 50 to 100 Kelvin. But you're doing it over about 220 nanometers by 500 nanometers. So it's about 25 milliwatts per pi. And the fact that it's silicon surrounded by glass makes that a lot easier because the glass doesn't really transmit heat all that well. No gotchas? Thanks, y'all. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay, so this concludes the open part of the event. So we're going to be calling the game. So I'd like to uh, ask everybody to be seated in the room, other than the committee members.